Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's Explorer Classroom Hangout. My name is Joe Grabowski from National Geographic, and I'll be your host for today. If you've been following along this month, we've been celebrating all things big and small. Now, before we meet today's guest on Varma, we're going to take a couple moments to use National Geographic's MapMaker Interactive. We're going to take a look at where some of our classrooms are joining us live from today. So bear with me for just one moment while I share my screen. And then we'll take a look at the map maker interactive so here we go going to entire screen all right so here i am i'm in Alora, ontario here in canada and if we back out just a little bit we can see some of our classrooms starting to come into focus we have classrooms joining me in milton ontario as well as bradford ontario if i back up just a little bit more you can see we have classrooms joining us in vermont a couple of classrooms in new jersey we go south a little more to florida Ons joining us in California, in Berkeley, and we'll back up just a little bit more to see that we have a classroom joining us live in Hawaii today. So a great group of classrooms joining us. Now, as I shift back from the screen share, it's just gonna take a moment. I do wanted to give a quick reminder to any classrooms who are joining us live via YouTube um, that you can send in questions via the YouTube chat sidebar. Let us know where you're watching from. As well, any classrooms who are watching along via Twitter, uh, please do take a moment uh, to use the hashtag Explore Classroom, tag at Nat Geo Education, because we love to see classrooms in action. All right, well, let's get to our main event today. So uh, Anvarma is joining us today. He's a National Geographic Explorer and photographer. So he's a science photographer working to tell the stories uh, behind the science of everything. So whether it's primate behavior or hummingbird bio, uh, mechanics, amphibian disease, or forest ecology. He's been photographing natural history subjects uh, all over the world. So in uh, 2017, On was named a National Geographic Emerging Explorer, and he's had several uh, stories in the magazine, as well as a cover story called Mind Suckers in November 2014. So On, it's so great to have you joining us live today. We're excited to learn more about your work. And of course, we'll take lots of questions from our classrooms joining us. Thanks so much, Joe, and hi, everybody. So I am talking to you from my backyard tool shed in Berkeley, California. I actually use this space, I also use it as a photo studio. So I photographed uh, a number of projects in this little storage space itself. And um, I wanted to start by telling you a little bit of how I became a photographer. So I didn't really grow up planning on being a photographer. I wanted to actually be a biologist. I grew up hiking around the woods and streams in uh, northern Georgia, where I grew up. And I thought really the only way to keep doing this for a career was to study science and become a professor. But when I came to Berkeley as, a, as an undergraduate, as a college student, um, I got an opportunity to work as a photographic assistant. And that meant um, a photographer contacted the biology department and um, wanted to uh, give you a sense for what that job was like kind of led me into photography. So I'm gonna share my screen here. All right, is that thing up? Um, hasn't shared yet. There it goes, yep. Yep, okay. And, um, so what this photo is showing is I am rappelling into a cave in Southern California. So I had no idea what this job entailed. I just knew I was working for a photographer. I thought it would just be uh, a couple of weeks over one summer while I was a student. And the first day the photographer handed me this suit and said, your job is to rappel into these caves and look for tiny bugs that live at the bottoms of these caves. The best photographer, and we ended up working together for years. And so, some of the other projects that we worked on 
Um, once we went to Southern California to climb giant sequoia trees. These are some of the largest trees in the world. And once this picture shows up, it's, it shows me about 200 feet off of the ground. These trees get to almost 300 feet tall. And our job was to photograph all of the bugs and the birds and the plants that live at the tops of these trees. And another project that we got to work on together was going all the way up to the Arctic, well past the Arctic Circle as part of Norway called Svalbard. And there we were photographing uh, some experiments that scientists were running to understand how ocean chemistry was changing with climate change. And so I'm gonna come back and turn off screen sharing here. So what those opportunities taught me was that, wow, photography is a way to really explore the world and learn about nature. And that's really what I always wanted. Opportunities are really what led me to start thinking about becoming a photographer instead of um, staying on track to being a scientist. So I would go out, I would help this photographer, I'd come home and I'd work with the biologists at Berkeley on their projects. I, I practiced my photography skills with them. And I applied for what's called a National Geographic Young Explorer Grant. And that meant that I could go to South America and photograph my own projects and come back home and uh, share my work with National Geographic. I went to Washington, DC, and I showed them my photographs. And they said, OK, this is cool, Anand. What else do you want to work on? And I had this idea that I learned from my friend. So I thought other creatures. These parasites have an amazing ability to not just feed on their host, but they actually can take over the biology, the behavior, the bodies of their hosts. And I propose to do a story on these kinds of mind-controlling parasites. And that became the first story that I did for National Geographic Magazine. So I'm going to go back to sharing my screen just to show you a couple of those images. All right, Joe, let me know when you when this picture pops up. Good to go. OK, so what you're looking at here is a ladybug that's standing over the cocoon of a parasitic wasp. So these wasps are really tiny. And what they do is they attack the ladybug, and they lay a single egg inside. And that baby wasp hatches inside the ladybug. It feeds on its insides, and when it's ready to come out, it squeezes its way out of the body of the ladybug, and it spins a cocoon in order to transform into an adult. But because it's vulnerable, it's, it's, it can be attacked by predators while it's sitting there waiting to grow up. It actually forces the ladybug to stick around and stand on top of it and scare off any predators. This is a crab that I photographed in Santa Barbara, Southern California, and it got infected by a parasitic barnacle. So this tiny little barnacle crawls into the body of the crab, and then it, if the crab started out as a boy, as a male, the parasite turns it into a female. It turns all the boys into girls. It can change the biology. It can change the structure of this animal. Over the course of a few weeks, the, the boy crab grows female part. And in particular, it makes the crab cares for those eggs. 
at all these tiny little specks, those are little baby parasitic barnacles that have just hatched out of this infected crab. And the last one I'm going to show you is a cricket that's been infected by a worm. And this worm grows up inside the cricket, and when it wants to come out, it forces the cricket to drown itself in a creek or a puddle so that the worm can come out and finish its uh, life as an aquatic creature. So what's cool about this particular, so let me switch back here. That picture that you saw there, I photographed three feet to my right, and I actually had the scientists here. I have a couple of preserved crickets arm halfway out, had the scientists phenomenon, this interaction, actually send me a bunch of these crickets so that I could keep them at home and I photographed them in my backyard. And actually you can find these crickets all over the world. And and these, these parasites infect all kinds of other insects too, cockroaches and praying mantis and um, cicadas. So if you're careful and you look outside on a rainy day in a puddle and you see a little worm wiggling around, sometimes that's because it's come out of a of a creature that has it's forced to drown itself in that puddle. So that was my first project and I, I really liked um, being able to take this things as gross and try to a couple more images for uh, next story I did these. So I'm going to go and share that. So this is another photograph that I that I took right here, uh, exactly where I'm sitting at this table. Uh, this is a honeybee that's just emerging from its comb. And if you look closely, you can see all of its tiny little hairs. They're really fuzzy little creatures. And so for this project, what I wanted to do was to show how scientists study these cool little creatures that we all know. So I went to labs across the country. This is a photograph I took in Louisiana, where the scientist Frank Rinkovich wanted to understand how pesticides affect honeybees. So. The experiment that he did is he would put these honeybees in a little paper cup and he'd poke holes in the cup and use that to send carbon dioxide and that that gas would put the the bees to calm them down and keep them from moving for just a few seconds and that means he could then drop a tiny amount of pesticide on their body you can see that needle with the little droplet there And what that meant is that the bees would then wake up, they'd be exposed to this pesticide, and he could track how it affects their health. And in particular, in this case, this is a pesticide that was used to control mosquitoes. So it was really important to try to control mosquitoes to prevent them from spreading disease. But he he also wanted to see, are we accidentally harming honeybees along the way? And this is a creature that actually does the most harm to honeybees in the United States. This is called a varroa mite. And this is another kind of parasite. It doesn't control the mind of the par- of the bees the way that those other parasites do, but it gets into the hive and it chews on the baby bees. Um, you're looking at a, a little critter that's about two millimeters long, like the size of a pinhead. And it chews on those baby bees and it spreads disease and um, it causes the colonies to collapse over time. So I wanted to show all these issues and I wanted to show the work that scientists were doing, but I was also keeping honeybees right here in my home in Berkeley. I actually kept them inside the storage shed to keep them warm. I drilled a hole in the wall so they could come and go. And I would watch how they would uh, develop over time. And I wanted to show how that process happened, how they grew up inside their hives. So with the help of some scientists here in California, we figured out how to raise bees in front of a time-lapse camera. So I'm going to show you the first 21 days of a bee's life condensed into just one minute. Here we go. This is the bee egg as it has larva. 
And these larvae then swim around inside the hive, and they're, and they're feeding on this white, milky, gooey substance that the bees, the adult bees, secrete for them. And then the larva transform into pupa. That's where their head and their legs start to separate. Here's that same pupation process. And below on the second row there, you can actually see the mites running around. And then the tissue, the cells in their head, they reorganize. The color forms in their eyes. And the last step of the process, their skin shrivels up, dries out, and then they sprout hair. The really my subject as intimately as possible. I kept these bees in my home for a whole year and I got to watch how they would go about their lives. And, you know, my goal was really to figure out how can I take images and videos of these creatures that nobody else has ever taken. And that was challenging because, you know, a lot of people have photographed bees and I was really scratching my head to think, okay, you know, what can I do differently? And Maybe the way to do that is to study these creatures myself and to really get to know them and to be able to experiment with them in my backyard. And that's how I, I got to become a beekeeper along the way. The last project I'm going to share with you real quick before I take some questions is a project I did about hummingbirds. So one of my friends at Berkeley studied hummingbirds and I would follow him around all over North and South America and I would see all the cool experiments he would do and the experiments that other scientists were doing. And I thought, okay, everybody knows a hummingbird is what real scientists are making about their bodies and their biology. So I proposed a project to National Geographic about the biomechanics of hummingbirds. And what that means is the study of how their bodies work. So one last screen share here. All right, Joe, can you see that photo? Yep, it's up. Okay, this is how scientists study the aerodynamics, how the air flows around a hummingbird's wings. They make actually a fog machine, a little miniature fog machine, and they place it inside a cage and they train the hummingbird to fly below it. And they can see what are called vorpool swirly pattern that um, tells how the air moves around the hummingbird's wings and it tells them a little bit about how the hummingbird's able to hover. And so I photographed this in Southern California, but I also went all the way to Cuba where the smallest bird in the world lives. And I photographed one perched on a penny. I trained it to perch on this penny inside of a cage and it shows you how tiny this little bird is. And that penny weighs actually more than the hummingbird itself. The penny weighs about two and a half grams, and the, the bee hummingbird weighs about 1.8 grams. And this is how a hummingbird tongue looks like. Uh, another friend of mine, Alejandro Rico Guevara, studies how they're able to lick. And so I had this hummingbird feed from a little uh, glass dish that um, I had made for it. And what you're seeing is that their fork, their tongue is actually forked. It splits into two different pieces and it's a little hollow tube that kind of inflates. It, 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 uh, it gets squished closed as it comes out of the bird's mouth. And as soon as it touches the nectar, it pops back into its tube shape and it uh, essentially pumps nectar into the bird's mouth. And here, you have a hummingbird that it's drop. And so it's shaking itself so vigorously that the water shoots off of its body. It's just like how your dog shakes, shakes itself dry, but it happens so fast, your eye can't see it. And this is one I uh, photographed in a lab right here in Berkeley. And the last thing I'll show you 
I was able to film these behaviors and some of these experiments with a really fancy camera that's able to capture the world 100 times slower than what your naked eye can see. So I'm just gonna play a little 30 second video of that shows hummingbirds flying around and drying themselves off. Here you go. the kind of work that I do. Really, I try to um, focus on stories about science, and I really like using the camera to show things that your naked eye can't see. So the movements that are too fast, the growth processes that are too slow, and the details that are too small. All right. Well, An, thank you so much for sharing that with us. I think sure. it's incredible the way that you're able to really bring a side to these things or those parasites or bees or hummingbirds that we've never seen before. So I know a lot of time and effort goes into it. You're inventing new techniques, you're keeping them right in your shed or your home. So it's pretty awesome the links that you go to to get these amazing photos and stories for us. Thanks, it's a way for me to keep learning and to keep exploring um, as I try to make these pictures. All right, well let's meet some of our classrooms. So let's, uh, let's see, let's go to our first class. We're going to turn on the mic in Mrs. Epler's class. There's some fourth graders who are joining us. I believe they're joining us from New Jersey. Let's see if I can get their microphone turned on. Hey, Mrs. Epler's class, how you doing? Uh, okay, so the microphones are cooperating right now. Mrs. Epler, do you mind just turning the mic on on your end? And I think I'll just- Hi. All right. Hi. Go ahead. Do you have any questions for me? Um, how much money do you really get per picture you get, per picture you make, or or like how um how many countries have you been to to um to take like one photo? So I missed part of that question. With the long does it take to take one photo? Is that right? Uh, yes. So it, it depends. So for example, the photograph of that cricket with the worm coming out of it, that's probably the photo that's taken me the longest to take. And that took about 28 days, almost a month of experimenting and trying different lighting out how to get the worm to show up. So that's probably the longest. It On average, it takes me about a week of uh, trial and error and trying something and tweaking the light and so on average I plan about a week for a photograph and that means I take between two and three thousand pictures to get one that's worth publishing in the magazine all right and I think the second part of his question was just do you get paid per picture or is it more like per story oh it depends so so far it's really per story uh, I propose a budget, I propose an idea, and if the magazine likes the idea, then I say, okay, well, I'd like 10 weeks to photograph this. These are all the places around the world that I want to go. And they actually pay me per day. Uh, so if it's it, based on, the, on the, the budget that I propose. So typically it ends up being kind of a, a lump payment for the story ahead of time. Now, the other way I could do it is if I went and did it my own grant or somebody else to pay for it and, and I didn't ask National Geographic ahead of time I could come to them after the fact and say here are all the pictures I've already taken would you like to publish them and in that case they would pay per image all right great question to start us off let's go to mrs. Barton's class third graders hanging out in Hawaii with us if you want to turn your mic on and say hi we'll grab a question hi, hi. Do you guys have any questions? Somebody would like to put their little shy. Okay, Salia. Nice and loud. Nice and loud. <clears throat> Just say it. 
why do the hummingbirds why do the hummingbirds take um, off the water? I why missed one. Oh, why do they take off the water? So, well, hummingbird has kind of a, a difficult challenge. It's such a tiny bird, it can't really store that much energy, but it actually has to use a lot of energy to fly the way that it flies around. So, problem is, you know, it's figured out this delicate balance of how to get enough food in order to fuel itself. But if it gets wet, all of a sudden it has to work way harder just to fly around. So just, just like that picture of the penny I showed you, you know, those hummingbirds don't weigh very much. And if they get wet, they have to work, you know, twice, three times, four times as hard just to go the same distance. So shaking themselves off means that they can just saves a lot of energy to dry off. All right, so let's jump to our next classroom. We're gonna go back to Vineland, New Jersey with some grade threes hanging out with us with Mrs. Igorov. If you wanna turn your microphone on for me and say hi, uh, we'll grab a question. All right, hello from Vineland. <laughs> All right, we have Anthony with a question. Anthony, can you uh, walk up and speak loud and clear? Um, that sounds a bit big. There you go. How did you get to the Arctic? Like, how did I? Hi, hi, Anthony. That's a good question. How did I get to the Arctic? So, um, I took a series of flights. So, from California, we flew to Oslo, the the capital of Norway, and then from Oslo, we uh, flew to a, a a city called Longyearbyen, which is in Svalbard. And then from there, we had to take a special uh, air flu scientists to a tiny little research station called Noy It's They told me it's the farthest northern, it's the farthest north permanent settlement in the world. So um, there's beyond that, there's some fishing camps and things like that, but there are no cities farther north than where I flew. So that was a series of airplanes. But then where you saw that photograph, that sort of selfie of me with the big orange suit, we then took a little boat and wrapped with the motor, uh, the bay, where we could then um, photograph the experiments that scientists were doing. The scientists themselves, many of them actually came on a boat from further south in Europe, and that boat is what brought all their scientific equipment with them. So I got to kind of take the short shortcut with airplanes, but um, if you have to take a lot of gear, then you have to go with, with the boat. Thanks for the question. All right, awesome question. Let's jump now to our next classroom. We're going to Mrs. Kiziar's class in Milton, Ontario. We've got some grade fours hanging out with us. Oh, sorry, Milton in the United States. Uh, if you want to turn your microphone on and say hi, we'll grab a question from you. Hi. Um, did the parasite hurt the bee? Did the parasite hurt the bee? Yes. So those little varroa mites, they do hurt the bees. They don't typically kill the bees outright. So what happens is they'll chew on the babies and they'll suck their blood. And what happens is when the babies grow up, they grow up a little bit smaller and often they, they have a disease called deformed wing virus. And so they form, they'll be a little bit smaller and overall their immune system is really compromised. It means that they're more likely to pick up all of these other diseases from fungus, from bacteria, from viruses. So usually what kills the bee itself is not the mite directly, but it's the diseases that the mite carries or that the bee gets from becoming weakened by the mite. All right, let's jump to another classroom. Let's go to, where haven't we been yet? There we go, Mr. Caswell's class. They're joining us in Burlington, Vermont, grade seven and eight. So if you guys wanna turn on your mic and say hi. <laughs> there, go. Hi. Are we on? 
Hi, I can hear you. You're on. We've got you. Um, could um, a brain like controlling virus ever happen to a human? So, could a brain controlling virus ever happen to a human? In some ways, yes. Like when you think about how rabies affects people, it, you could sort of consider that a kind of uh, manipulating parasite. So, rabies kind of creates some, in its final stages, will make uh, its host, whether that's a dog or a person, more aggressive and more likely to, you know, attack somebody else in order to pass on that virus. So that's one example that you could kind of consider to be um, a parallel behavior. Another one that's, that's, that's really interesting, but it's unclear how it affects humans. It's a parasite called Toxoplasma gondii. And scientists have really worked out very carefully how they affect their normal host, which is a rat. And what it does to rats is it makes them less afraid of cats. It actually makes them attracted to the smell of cats. And what that means is they're more likely to get eaten by a cat, and that parasite actually wants to live inside of the digestive tract of a cat. And so it, it moves from cat to cat by manipulating these intermediate hosts of the rat. So that's its own whole system. But where this becomes relevant to humans, estimate about one fifth, 20% of the human population actually has this same parasite in our own bodies. And that's because if we get exposed to cat droppings, you can pick them up, and this parasite, since it's so well adapted to live inside of rats and rats, there is two things is, okay, well, we know what it does to rats, and we know that we share some similarities to rats in terms of how our brains work or how our bodies work, and there are some indications that people who are infected with this are more likely to develop certain kinds of uh, neurological problems. So there's some evidence that, okay, maybe this tiny little parasite might be affecting us, but it's, it's really hard to say, and our brains are much more complicated, and our behaviors are much more complicated. So the jury's still out on that one, but it's certainly possible that there are parasites that we still don't understand um, that are affecting our behaviors in some ways. All right, well, and we have a whole bunch of uh, live viewers and a few questions have come in. So I'm going to sure. pop in a couple of those before we wrap up for today. So there's two that have come in from online that are good ones. So the first one is wondering about the smallest thing you've ever taken a photo of. And the last one is how many cameras do you have and do you have any in the shed you could show us? Oh, yeah. Okay. So smallest thing I've ever photographed was probably a few months ago I was asked to photograph the what's called an inclusion which is a kind of defect in a mineral and in this case i was photographing the defect in a diamond um, and it shows how that diamond formed in it is job in terms of In terms of a living creature, the smallest thing I photographed is a half a millimeter long. In terms of cameras, um, I have kind of lost track of how many cameras I have. Somewhere around six or seven. Um, the coolest camera I have is right here. So this is actually a kind of uh, video camera. And this is what I'm using to photo to film my current project on jellyfish. And so what's really cool about this camera, this is the screen that's attached. I can put the uh, the lens on this side here. It's called a red epic. It's a really high resolution camera. So we, we think about HD is kind of the latest is is kind of uh, a standard for 
videos that you see online. Uh, and then there's 4K video, and that's about four times the resolution of HD. And this can actually take 6K, which I actually don't know the math, but it's it's basically can capture a huge amount of resolution, and it can all capture movements like those hummingbird movements faster. All right. Well, that's a pretty fancy toy. I look forward to seeing some of the footage that comes back from the jellyfish. Yeah. All right. Well, And, I know you have to get going um, right at the end of the hangout today. So first of all, I want to thank you for hanging out with us today, sharing some of your big or sorry, your small work with us, with the hummingbirds and the parasites and the bees. It's, it's absolutely incredible. Um, where could students go if they want to dive a little deeper? Do you have an Instagram? I do have an Instagram. Um, and all of the videos that I showed you about uh, bees and parasites are all available online. You can go to my website, or even if you just type into, into Google or into YouTube, um, you can find more videos of parasite behavior and bee movement and hummingbird movement there. All right. Very cool. Well, we look forward to following your work and hopefully catching you in the field one day. But again, thank you for taking us into your shed and showing us uh, some of your work. And then classrooms, thank you so much for hanging out. Thank you for your awesome questions. Don't forget, if you took any pictures, post them on Twitter with the hashtag Explore Classroom and tag at Nat Geo Education. And then on the last thing we'll do today is we'll get the classrooms to turn on their microphones and nice and loud, uh, big goodbye and thank you. They're starting already, but you got to turn your microphones on or we can't hear you. We're so good at that part. Well, once again, everybody, thanks so much for hanging out with us. That was our last hangout of the month. Next month, we are jumping into uh, celebrating awesome women in science and exploration. So we're kicking all the men out and we're hosting a ton of awesome female explorers, scientists, adventurers, conservationists from all over the world. So again, on, thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you classrooms and we'll see you next time. All right. Bye everybody. <laughs>